Hello, in this video I will show you how working with data is made simple with Scala and how you can limit the problems of mutable state by coding in a functional style with immutable data. You will also see how to apply these techniques to common coding tasks such as building a serverless function. According to Brian Getz, the language architect of Java, mutable data is harder to validate and makes code harder to test. The fact is, relying on shared mutable state is a large source of complexity in code, often leading to hidden bugs that are difficult to isolate and leading you to program defensively. On screen are some learning resources on this topic, which are linked in the description. So, if mutability can be so complex, what can you do about it? Well, I think a powerful way to solve many problems caused by mutable state for free is to code with immutable data and expressions. An expression is any snippet of code that gives you a new value when evaluated. And immutable data is data that can only be modified by creating a copy. You can then sequence expressions to perform successive updates to your data. And the best part is Scala makes it easy to code this way. It comes with a rich expression-based collections library with powerful transformations. Lightweight syntax makes it simpler to create and use your own immutable data types. And function bodies and control structures such as try, catch, and if, then, else are all expressions as well. Put together, these Scala features help you write less code and focus on solving your problems. First, let's take a look at the most useful area to introduce immutable data, the collections. In Scala, you can directly use immutable collections such as list, vector, set and map, all without an import. On screen are some examples, modeling some simple structures. First, a map of capital cities. Second, a list of ascending prime numbers. And third, a set containing the characters representing vowels in the English language. Scala's collections model data as snapshots that are frozen at the point of construction. Any future update will create a new value containing the changes. For example, here I concatenate two lists to join them together. This makes a new list value which you can imagine to be a transformation of the original list to include its additional elements from the right side, as you see in this diff. Immutable updates like this mean that all changes stay local, explicit, and under your control, meaning collections are safe to share with all parts of the code. And along with safe lookup methods, collections are easy to update and analyze. They come with a rich library of operations, meaning that you can solve most collection problems in a few short expressions, all without complex looping or recursion. Let's see some examples. Filter creates a new collection with only the elements that match a specific predicate. Map creates a new collection by transforming each and every element. And fold the left lets us produce some summary value based on combining all elements of the collection. Many more of the methods are described in the collection methods chapter of the Scala book, also linked below. So, immutable collections are also defined with structural implementations for equals and hash code methods, which makes them safe to use as values in caches, such as a hash set. However, it is worth noting that collection immutability is shallow, i.e. the elements themselves could be mutable. As I mentioned earlier, collection operations each produce a new value, which raises a question. Where do you save this new value? There are two main ways to manage this. You can either chain expressions together with a dot, which will throw away some intermediate values, and it can get messy the longer the chain becomes. Or a good practice is to save intermediate results 
to a named value using the val keyword. Values are recommended because they separate the code into smaller, more descriptive steps, which are more readable and easier to refactor when code becomes too long. Fresh names also make clear the dependencies between steps, as I have highlighted for you on this slide. If I instead change num to a mutable variable, i.e. by replacing val with var, now multiple steps assigned to num, and if the order previously mattered, there is now no dependency enforced between these steps, making it harder to refactor safely. For example, if I swap the filter and map operations, the result of the program changes, which could have unintended knock-on effects in the rest of the code. In larger examples, it could be difficult to immediately spot problems such as this, leading to bugs. Values are also great for handling multiple return values, which are modeled as tuples. In this example, I have partitioned the list into even numbers and odd numbers, which returns a tuple. I then use a tuple pattern to extract the two named values. This example also shows that control structures in Scala, such as if then else, are also expressions, so can return a new value, such as to pick the largest from the odds and evens. So, you have seen that even though Scala's collections are completely immutable, they still have a fluent API that is concise and readable. Now, I will show you how to make and use your own immutable data structures in Scala. The simplest way to begin is to use case classes and enums. Case classes aggregate several fields into one. This is also known as a product type. Enums are best used when you want to make different choices in your application depending on the shape of the data. They aggregate several product types into a single sum type. By default, the fields in a case class or individual enum case are immutable, but they both come built in with a copy method, which makes it simple to produce a new value with some specific fields updated. Case classes and enums also give you structural implementations for equality and hash code, like the collections. This means that they are compared by the values of their fields rather than the object's identity. You can learn more about how to design domain models with case classes and enums in our course, Effective Programming with Scala, and other videos on this channel, linked in the description. Now I've shown you the tools to program with immutable data, let's see how you can use these techniques in real-world code. I think a perfect case study for transforming immutable data with expressions is a serverless function. Typically, they are often short-lived and performing one task before shutdown and without any complex management of state. Say I'm building an inventory service for a car dealership and they need an API that, given some queried car models, responds with their average price. I have chosen to build a serverless function to implement this API. Its request body comes in the form of a JSON array of car objects with make, model, and year fields, where each object corresponds to a car in the inventory database. The response body will also contain a JSON array of summary objects, a car field, which corresponds to one of the cars from the request, and an average price field representing the average price in the inventory for the associated car model. For a basic architecture, I have also got access to a database with a car table, with many columns, including the same make, model, and year columns, plus a price column that we're interested in. The serverless function will need to process the input JSON array to extract the queried car models and then look for matching cars in the database extracts their price to compute an average before serializing the cars and associated average prices to another JSON array. So here is the code implementing the serverless function. 
It is inspired by real-world Scala code used in industry. The entry point of the serverless function is the average prices object, which extends serverless with two type arguments. The first is a list of api.car, and the second is a list of api.summary. Together, they model the input and output of the eventual HTTP API, corresponding to the arguments and result type of the response method, which implements the business logic. And just to confirm, you can see up here that these API types have the same fields as the sample API inputs and output JSON that I showed earlier. So the point of the serverless class is to wrap the response method in a harness that maps between JSON and the corresponding input and output data of response, and so adapting it for processing HTTP requests. JSON conversion is possible because I marked my API type definitions with derives JSON. This tells the compiler to generate a JSON coder automatically and make it available to the serverless class. However, it is worth noting that the compiler is only able to automatically generate JSON coders for these API types because it can verify that they are plain immutable data and with no encapsulated state. So now I have my input data, it's time to dive into the business logic and fetch matching cars from the database. Here, I have declared another data structure, car, which has all the fields I need to fetch from the database, including the price field. However, I don't want to type out database queries manually, so I'm going to derive the table type for car, which will help me work with the car table as if it were a Scala collection. You can see here that I take the table for car and can join it with the input cars list modeling the Cartesian product of both before collecting the resulting pairs so that I only keep the cars from the database with the same make, model, and year. This query is then compiled by the fetch macro call into an efficient prepared statement at runtime. Again, this is all made possible with minimal boilerplate because my car data type is immutable, so the compiler can make more assumptions about my data. The last thing to do in the business logic is to compute the summary values. Assuming a successful database fetch, I now have a list of matching values returned from the database, instantiated to the car data type. To compute the summary, I use group map method to convert the database car type back to the API car type and to extract the price from each car. Group map results in a map from keys of type API car to values where they are lists of big decimal. I then map the resulting sequence of key value pairs to a single summary value each reducing the list of prices to a single average by computing the mean. If the database fetch failed, then it will throw an exception that is handled by the serverless framework. And that's everything. The resulting list will get serialized to JSON and delivered as a response, and not a single field was mutated. So what did you see here? Because I used immutable data throughout this example, the entire code becomes very declarative and reads much more as a specification for the desired result rather than a sequence of low-level steps to perform various tasks. And thanks to automatic code generation assistance from the compiler, I never had to worry about mechanical tasks such as producing bindings to the database or manually writing a fast JSON serializer. So, if after seeing the power of immutable data, you are still not convinced, I have three extra benefits that may still interest you. First, because immutable data can be freely shared, it relieves some dimensions of complexity to understanding code. This is key to a concept called local reasoning, i.e. there is no need to chase around the code base to trace unexpected mutations or to figure out the possible initialization steps of an object. Second, 
With immutable data, we can still be sure that any validation we perform on our data will remain secure for its entire lifetime. And because case classes have such low boilerplate, they encourage you to use more of them and more precise types to wrap data that is then proven to be valid at construction, which helps to make illegal states unrepresentable. You can find out more in my other video, Pick Any Card, linked below. Third, your code becomes more testable by default. Because immutable data cannot change, Dependencies must be passed around explicitly through parameters and results to make any updates. This means that we can more easily control the state of an application that we are testing. This has a double-edged sword, however, that potentially leads to more boilerplate heavy code. But boilerplate can be managed either with metaprogramming or with wrapper types like the state monad, which I will not explain in this video. So to summarize, in this video, we have seen how programming with immutable data and expressions, one of the core elements of functional programming, leads to a declarative style of code, which requires a new way of thinking when compared to the imperative style. And with that, we have traded one complexity, namely unsafe shared mutable state for another, which is the extra effort needed to explicitly shuffle around state, but safely. I argue, however, that immutable data is worth the effort to improve the overall safety, readability, and expressivity of code across your projects. If any of the surrounding topics that I mentioned in this video have piqued your interest, such as learning more in depth about data structures or problems associated with mutability in code, you can find all relevant links in the description of this video. Thank you for watching and I hope that you have learned a few tips and see you in the next video.